Good morning. Glad to have you all here. Good morning. Good to see you. Welcome back. So here for the weekend. Good, good. Don't, don't worry. We're just having a conversation. So. <laughs> uh, well, it's good to have you all here today. Um, we have several people who are out this weekend and uh, traveling different places. And so, uh, but we're glad that you all are here and glad for those who are joining us online as well. Um, I want to make you aware of a, a few announcements. We do need a, a children's Sunday school teacher for the month of May. So if you uh, are able to do that, let us know at the office. Um, I'm going to put these on so I don't miss all of my notes. Um, this week, uh, the women will, will gather for their meet and eat um, meals uh, at McAllister's Deli. You can see the, the times that are listed there and uh, if you need more information about signing up, just contact, contact the office as well. Uh, men, we will be meeting next Wednesday, a week from Wednesday at the Mad Greek. We've decided that we're going to go emotional like the women normally do. Go to the emotional restaurants. So, but there's no angry Italian anymore. I know. I know. So, I mean, it was kind of funny. It, it was funny, wasn't it? I mean, that ladies, you went to the angry Italian and then the Mad Greek. That is sort of funny. So I guess we need to go to the crazy tomato, right, Bill? <laughs> that fits us better. <laughs> so, um, but we're going to go to Mad Greek uh, a week from Wednesday. Um, next week, we have a congregational meeting, and uh, there were a couple of emails that went out from the session this week to members of the congregation. The reason that I mention that is we've been having these issues with emails not making it to people. So if you are a member of the church, you've not received those emails and you want a copy, just contact the church office and uh, we'd be happy to get that information to you. Um, there's been, uh, as Ben has explained to us, there's been some uh, tightened security protocols within certain uh, email companies, Gmail, Outlook, all these different places. And so uh, and AOL is one of them and we've been getting emails bounced back to us uh, when we send out uh, group emails and things like that. So um, the other thing you can do is check your junk or your spam folders in your email. Um, and every email app is a little bit different. So just go there and see if maybe uh, our correspondence has been going there. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's, I think that's all the announcements. Um, I do want to draw your attention to the, the, uh, the second page of the announcements and uh, um, the Women's Leadership Committee, uh, the, the, the uh, positions and the, the names of those who are in those positions are listed on the back. That's a good piece of information, ladies, for you to, to know. Um, so, yeah. Is there, are there any other announcements that I've missed? All right. Uh, let me mention a couple of prayer requests. Um, we want to continue to pray for Matthew Ledford. Um, he is making, he's making incremental steps, right? And we, we like baby steps uh, because that, that means that, you know, there's progress. And so we're thankful that there's, there's progress and, and he does have a long road ahead of him. But, uh, but we are thankful for, um, for him being able to be at, at the Shepherd Center and receiving the care there. Um, we want to continue to pray for Ben Lawson's mother, Brenda, as she is having uh, issues um, related to her liver, and so they're, they're working uh, with, she, she has a, a, an appointment, uh, actually I think it's this week, with a specialist, so, but, uh, and then uh, we want to continue to pray for um, the family of Sue Guy as she is on hospice care. This is Barbara Stitt's friend, um, the mother of Angel Johnson, who uh, Angel and Bruce and their daughters um, uh, were a part of our church a few years ago, so we want to pray for them. Um, what other prayer requests do you have? Yes, Linda. All right, so uh, Linda's grandson, Michael Gronsky, um, is going to be having his tonsils out, so we want to pray for that, and 
that could de could actually help with some other things that that are going on with him. So, all right. Yes, George. Oh, I remember that now. Yeah, yeah. Um, George's George Stone's cousin, John Har, correct? Okay. Um, they just found out that uh, George just found out that he has pancreatic cancer and that he's receiving chemo treatment. So we want to want to pray for him. All right. Any other requests? Yeah, Steve. That's uh, an update on Peter with his concussion. He seems to be trending in a better direction lately in terms of sensitivity to sound and light. Uh, Carrie Lynn's been sick. She had COVID, so she's recovering from that. It's kind of taken a while, but I just pray that both of those continue okay. in good direction. Yeah, so um, uh, Steve has asked, uh, given us an update on, on Peter Paulson and his concussion that he's been dealing with for several months. Um, that he is trending in a better direction, and uh, um, so that's good. And Carrie Lynn has, is getting over COVID, and uh, so we want to pray for her in that. All right, anything else? Oh, yes, yes. Last night, um, as uh, there's a war in the Middle East, um, the uh, Iran attacking Israel. So, yeah, thank you. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us to love and serve and worship you. Uh, we do lift up these needs before you. There are, are many, and yet these are just a glimpse of the things that are on our hearts and minds. Uh, we continue to pray for Matthew and ask that, that you would bring healing to him. We lift up uh, Brenda Lawson to you and Sue Guy. Uh, we pray for uh, little Michael and for, um, for John Har, as all of them have uh, different things that they're struggling with. We pray for your healing, for your comfort, your peace, and your will to be done in their lives. Uh, Lord, I, I continue to pray for Peter and ask that you would bring full healing for him uh, with this concussion that he has been enduring. Uh, we thank you that he's He's in a that he's making progress, and we just pray for for full healing soon. And and we pray the the same for Carrie Lynn that you would bring her to full healing from dealing with COVID. And Father, we uh, we just pray for all those involved in in this conflict in the Middle East between Iran and Israel. And uh, you know the details, the intricacies, and we just pray that you would um, that you would work your will. Father, again, we thank you for bringing us here today. Um, and uh, for, for the way that you love us in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand as we have our call to worship? Call to worship is taken from Psalms 18. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock. Exalted be the God of my salvation. Let's join together as we sing, Great is Thy Faithful.
Father God, we come before you now because you are faithful. We are not. We are sinners in your sight, deserving your full justice, your wrath, your condemnation. But you, in your faithfulness, in your faithful, steadfast love, mercy, and grace, provided the way for us to be made right with you, for your justice to be met out in your Son, so that all can be made right for us by faith in him. We praise you, Father, for your faithfulness. We praise you, Jesus Christ, for willingly following the will of your Father, offering your own life in place of ours so that your blood could cover our sin. The death requirement for our sin you took on yourself so that by faith in you we can be made right with God. And we praise you, God the Holy Spirit, the one who opens our eyes to see what we need before God, to see that Jesus is the only way true in life, only only way truth in life and that no one can come to the father except through him you holy spirit also work in the hearts and lives of believers the same resurrection power that caused jesus to rise from the grave we praise you god the father god the son and god the holy spirit and we ask that you would meet us here in this place and work in us what is pleasing to you in jesus name amen you may be seated. <clears throat> we have the opportunity now to come before the Lord and in a general way confess our sins to him and to confess any specific sins that the Lord has brought to heart or mind. So let's pray together. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men in thought and word and deed, in the evil we have done and in the good we have not done, through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Now let's take a few moments to silently confess any specific sins that the Lord has brought to your mind. In him, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. This is the, the good word that we have from the scriptures to assure us of our forgiveness in Christ, that it is in him that we have forgiveness. Please join me for our offertory prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. Also, thank you for the many blessings that you continue to bestow upon us. This time in our service, we take the opportunity to collect our tithes and offerings and give back a portion of those things that you give to us so, so currently, so often. We ask for your blessings on these gifts. In Jesus' name, amen.
apparently you have to turn these on. <laughs> yeah, it's always been our joke that when different singers sing that, you know, sometimes they turn your mic on, sometimes they don't. So I, I thought I was a guy that didn't turn it on. You know, when we take uh, vows to join the church, one of the things that uh, Andy has been doing as we take our vows to do our things, basically he has to say, with God's help, I do. And this week as I was having a devotional, I was reading it, and, and basically what the devotion was sharing was, with me was, on your own, you can't do nothing. You ever thought about that? I mean, uh, personally, it's it's one of those things that we do. Um, I, I, I got tickled. You know, you, you take a little kid and you show them how to do something one time. You you ask them, do you need help doing this the next time? And what's the response? Yeah. No, <laughs> I've got it. And, you know, we just learn to... Um, say that in different ways as we get older <laughs> you know no i've got it and one of the things as i was reading this devotional that was sharing that really it's a wonderful way to develop your relationship with god daily moment by moment if anything you go to do you just say with god's help i can do it um even things as simple as I was working in, at my rental on Kent's the other day, and, and I was taking my spray gun apart. And there is this spring in that spray gun that is, is it an eighth inch round, Kent? And, and, and maybe three quarters of an inch long? I dumped that in a box of brush, and we dumped it on a brush pile behind his house. The thing does not work without it. And basically, we was walking back there, and I was going, Lord, the only way we're going to find this spring is if you help us find it. Now, sometimes he helps us find the spring. Sometimes he doesn't help us find the spring. Believe it or not, we pushed that pile of rubbish back that was probably yay high. And guess what was at the bottom? Just as glaring, as pretty as you could please. There was that spring. And I say this to say this. Thank you is a great response to a conversation also. All through your day, there's going to be those small, hidden blessings. Not only do you say, with God's help, I can do it, say thank you.
join together as we pray the prayer that Jesus uh, gave us as an example. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Good morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this day. Truly, it is beautiful. We thank you for this gift of all the people that you have brought out this morning. Truly, they are beautiful. We know that we are people called by your name. And Lord, we should rejoice and be thankful because of that privilege. And as we've said, it's not by anything that we have done or can do. But it is only through the gift of life that is given through Jesus Christ. Lord, may we rejoice in this day. May we be glad. Lord, but also, may we know that you are God. You are holy. You are just. And Lord, that you require from us to know this and to live in a way that gives you honor and gives you glory. But we thank you for the love and mercy and kindness that you show. And we know, Lord, that only through this can we be accepted by the blood of Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, that this day, that out of grateful hearts, Lord, that we will want to know you more and more. The Lord God, the giver of life, the giver of breath. And we pray, Lord, that as we get to know you more and more, your love, your grace, your mercy, your kindness. Lord, that this will be reflectors of who you are. And, Lord, that we can learn to love others in the same way that you love us. We know, Lord, that this is not something that we can do naturally. Again, it is a gift that you give us. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us to desire this, to want to love you more, to want to love our neighbor more. And, Lord, we pray that as we seek you, Lord, that you'll give us a desire to, to want to, to know your word. Oh, Lord, want to hear your word. We pray that you'll be with Andy this morning as he brings it. Lord, that we'll have ears to hear. Lord, that you'll give us understanding. And Lord, for those that can't be with us, whether they be traveling or, or an illness, Lord, we pray that you'll be with them. And those that are Ill, Lord, help us to be your hands and feet, to reach out in your name. Lord, to, to just minister. We know, Lord, that that's what we desire when we're alone. So we pray, Lord, that you will help us to do that. <clears throat> Again, we thank you for this day. And we pray that all glory will be yours. In Jesus' name, amen. We take an opportunity each week to, to pray for... Uh, each other, and we also take an opportunity to pray for Andy as he brings the message. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dale, would you mind to pray for us as a people, and 
Andy, would you pray for Andy, our pastor, please? Father, we are grateful that we get to come and be in your house to hear your word. I pray for our pastor that uh, he's worked diligently to prepare for this message, and now I ask that you would bless that. I, I pray that you would give him uh, the words to speak and for our hearts to receive by your Holy Spirit, Lord, what you have us to hear. And may we leave here uh, convicted by the uh, word that you've given us today. We pray in Jesus' name. I'd invite you to turn in your copy of the scriptures to Romans chapter 8. Uh, we will get back to our series in John in two weeks. Uh, this coming week I'll be on vacation. Clint Blevins is going to be filling the pulpit next Sunday. Um, and uh, so earlier in the week I actually had planned on uh, having us look at Proverbs 16, 1 to 9, which has a deal with um, about our decision-making and God's role in our decision-making. And, and yet, as I was considering the different things that are going on in various people's lives, I wanted us to look at a scripture that would bring us great hope and great joy. And yet, in order to have that great hope and great joy, there's something difficult we have to come to terms with. And so we're going to look at Romans 8, 1 to 11 this morning and, and, and see what we need now. What do we need right now? I'm going to invite you now to stand if you're able. We stand in honor of God who has given us his holy, inspired, and errant word. Hear the word of the Lord from Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now... No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Father, we come to this, your holy word, and we ask that you would make it sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. The story is sadly familiar. And it goes something like this. A father says to his son, you are worthless. You won't amount to anything. And his words and his actions throughout his life testify to what his father thinks about him. And so throughout his life, 
Those words cut through him to his soul. I mean, how could a father say something like that? How could a father be like that to his son? And so these words drive this man into despair. And in an effort to escape his pain, in an effort to drown out the words, he runs to all kinds of things. He runs from one relationship to another. He runs to heavy drinking, even dabbles in anything that might drown out the words that continue to echo in his soul. And as his life spirals out of control, the Christians in his life look at him and they say, man, he's so washed out, bouncing from one job to another, probably just looking for another fix. We might even echo the words of his father, he's so worthless. Look, he hasn't amounted to anything. We have a father who says something similar, condemning words that are meant to penetrate our souls, to tell us you're not worth God's love. You're not going to amount to anything. God doesn't love you. This father is the father of lies. It's easy for us to look at someone else's life, at someone else's sin, and consider them a vile offender against God. And they may be. But do we put ourselves in their same shoes? That we deserve the same condemnation we may give to someone in that position. Words can kill, words can heal. But the blood of Jesus speaks a better word than the father of lies. And the word we need now is that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the good news. This is the gospel we need now. And there's three things I'd like us to see from this passage today. The gospel, how we get in the way of the gospel, and why we can have confidence in the gospel even when we get in the way. The gospel, how we get in the way of the gospel, and why we can have confidence in the gospel even when we get in the way of it. So first, the gospel. We see it in the first two verses there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Let's, let's pull this apart a little bit. We need to ask the question, why do we need the gospel? Why do we need to hear there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Because by birth, we're born in sin, we're born in a standing before God. We stand condemned before Him. N.T. Wright, in his little book called Romans for Everything, Everyone, not for everything, everyone, says this, this, this statement of no condemnation, he says this assurance can, of course, only carry its full force for someone who has pondered carefully the seriousness of sin and the reality of God's judgment. Remember I said we have to deal with something we don't want to deal with in order to get to the hope and joy? And, and what we need to deal with is that our sin deserves God's holy, just condemnation. And what Paul is saying in his letter at this point, he's saying the law of God is what shows us we can't make ourselves right with God. We can't be good enough. Because our flesh, and by, here, by flesh here he means our sinful nature, our, our flesh, our sinful nature, it weakens us. Even on our best day when we do really good things and we think, wow, God would be really proud to have me as his son or his daughter, we're still tainted with our sin. And even a little bit of sin deserves God's justice. 
So who needs this gospel? The gospel is that, that or, or why we need the gospel, we, we need it because our sin demands justice. We need some kind of good news. We need this verdict of, of no condemnation. But who needs it? Well, the obvious answer is those who don't trust Jesus, those who are not Christians, those who are not believers, those who, who reject Jesus. And we know that, that, that in the scriptures it says that those are, are those who have no hope to save themselves because we're born in sin as enemies of God. And it's true. Who needs the gospel? Sinners. The not so obvious answer, and this is who Paul is writing to, Christians need the gospel. In fact, in Romans 7, which, by the way, I wasn't a math scholar, but it comes before Romans 8, just to let you know. In Romans 7, and if you could pull that up, Michael, I, I want to commend Michael. He is a one-man show this morning running the audio video. He's the one who came up and let Mike know, turn your mic on, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> in Romans 7, Paul writes this. He says, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. He, by the way, he's writing as a Christian. And, and you're going to hear a lot of things here, and I'm going to try to just, in a very short way, kind of bring it all together. So try not to get too confused by, by what he says here. He says, for, verse 15, For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law but that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Any of you ever feel like that? For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. I'm sure you never feel that. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. And in the original, there were no chapter breaks, there were no verse breaks, he immediately says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It all goes together. In other words, we all need the gospel. We need it now. Because we struggle with sin. If you're not a believer, you need Jesus. You need him to cover your sin. You need him to take God's condemnation for yourself. And if you are a believer, you struggle. And when you think you're not struggling, that may be the time where you need to really pay attention. For those who don't know Jesus, knowing him is necessary for life eternal. For those who have life eternal, the gospel is necessary to be reminded of the life we have in him. So what is the gospel? How can, how can Paul write, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? Verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh but according to the spirit. The good news, that's what the word gospel means. The good news, the gospel means is that God the Father sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. 
Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit and therefore did not have a sinful nature. And so what Paul is explaining, he, he wasn't weakened by the flesh. He wasn't weakened by a sin nature. He took our sin on himself and he took our sin's condemnation on himself. So that, as it says, the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled. We can't fulfill the righteous requirement of the law. It's impossible. But Jesus did. But notice, in whom the righteous requirement of the law was fulfilled. It says... So that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Well, that sounds weird. Doesn't it? I mean, maybe we've read it so many times it doesn't sound weird. Wait. Jesus did something. He fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law. In other words, he was perfectly righteous. And he he took... The condemnation for our sin. It says he condemned sin in himself. Think about that. We are pronounced as those who no longer have condemnation. Why? Because instead of us being condemned, Jesus condemned our sin. What a wonderful reversal. But he says, or it says, that the righteous requirement of the law that he fulfilled would be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. This means that for those who trust in Jesus' work for them, His righteousness is now ours. Those who genuinely believe that their sin requires God's holy and just condemnation, and there's nothing that they can do to make themselves right with God. For those who have faith in Jesus' sacrifice, on the cross, that it was for them, and that he took their condemnation in his flesh, he gives us his righteousness, which means he removes our unrighteousness, our, if we can use the language, and this may sound weird, but our weakness by the flesh, if you will, because he takes our sinful nature on himself on the cross, And he extinguishes God's justice for our sin. He condemns our sin in his flesh. The work has been done. It is finished. In Jesus, the condemnation that we deserve is fully satisfied. Isn't that good news? I mean, good news, that just doesn't sound right in our culture because we like superlatives. We like things to just be extreme. You know, we even have good, better, best, and good is actually the worst, right? (laughs) But when we say good, we mean complete, whole, the best, the best, best, best. Is it Little Caesars that has the extra most bestest pizza or something like that? It's like, you know, (laughs) this is what N.T. Wright says. He says, you will seldom come upon a fuller and more exact statement of what God achieved in Jesus the Messiah, his son. Like someone in the desert discovering a small spring emerging from a huge cavern or a cavern of water, there is enough here to live on for quite some time. This is the gospel. This is the good news of great joy that is for all those who trust in Jesus. Now, We need to talk about how we get in the way of the gospel because that's where Paul goes. Verse 5, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. It it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. 
Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. When we talk about how we get in the way of the gospel, please don't hear me say that we can make the gospel null and void. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about in our day-to-day lives, how do we get in the way of the gospel and our, in our understanding of the gospel and the freedom that Jesus brings? Well, Paul says here, it has to do with our mindset. How we set our minds on things can get in the way of the gospel can get in the way of our experience, if you will, of the gospel in the day-to-day. In other words, what he's saying is we're responsible for what we set our minds upon. And there are two ways in this part of the passage that, uh, that we can understand kind of what is going on. This, maybe Paul is talking about someone who's not a Christian, who doesn't have the Spirit of Christ indwelling in them or indwelling them and that is part of this but he's also speaking to someone who is a christian but struggles to live by the spirit in fact it's interesting because in this passage we see um setting their minds on uh, that that phrase that i'm gonna do a little bit of a, a deeper dive into the, the language here paul uses both the verb and the noun of this and I'll be honest, I wasn't like a great grammar scholar. I did Greek, I did Hebrew in seminary, all that. You know, I, I learned it. And, but sometimes I just don't get why it's significant about certain things. But this, this is what struck me. The verb is an active verb. It means actively pursuing something, what we set our minds upon. It's the active pursuit, what we're actively thinking about, what we're putting ourselves in a position to have our minds influenced by, to think about. It's the active pursuit of setting our minds in a direction. But when we change that to the noun, which is actually most of the the rest of the verses, even though it reads in our English translations like it's a verb or a participle, it means it's a mindset. It is something we possess. Now, why is that significant? Maybe it's just to me. But I think what this speaks to is what we pursue with our minds is what we possess in our minds. In other words, what we pursue shapes our thinking and what we're focused upon. Pursuing the Spirit means seeking His lead in our lives. He works through God's word, and he, he shapes us in it. Putting our minds on the things of Christ is, is focusing on his word in prayer and being with his people. Those are the normal means that God uses to shape us. And pursuing the flesh, pursuing things that are not godly, things that are sinful means pursuing the things that we want without any focus or thought to the things of God and without any submission to the things of God. So the two ways to to set our minds, in other words, two ways to set our minds towards something and to live by them are, are either by the flesh or by the Spirit, And so we learn what this means to set our mind on the Spirit. It says to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. And and then we also learn, because we see this interweaving, right? Paul is interweaving these two, this comparison contrast. He says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, for those who are in the flesh cannot please God. What we're pursuing with our minds is what we possess in our minds, and that's where our lives will go. They will go in a direction where we're leading toward life and peace, or inevitably to death if we're following the things of the flesh. What do we learn here? We learn that we are responsible agents 
in the battle for our minds, in the battle for our life focus. We're responsible for our mindset. There are no allowable excuses. We can't blame our past. We can't blame our family of origin. We can't blame our kids, our spouse, our influencers, like social media influencers, whatever. We can't just blame everybody else or something else. We stand responsible for God for where we set our minds. Now, I know that most who are here would consider themselves Christians and growing Christians and And we would say, yes, amen, that's right. And it's easy to think, I get it. I don't have a problem. But what we're talking about here is Paul's way of saying, you know, we can be hostile to the things of God, and maybe we don't even realize it. But but I would say that anything that we add to the gospel shows that we are actually not living by the Spirit in a in life and peace, but we're actually living toward death. But we don't like to think that we're focused on things that lead toward death. But anytime we add to the gospel, we do that. Because we're saying it's Jesus plus this, or Jesus minus this. Several years ago, I was a pastor in a different town. This was nobody here, nobody you know. I'm going to call him Don. And I had a, a lunch. I noticed that he was he was upset with something that had happened. And uh, and I was finding that with Don, um, any time that we disagreed on something, he made it personal. And so, I said, "Hey, can we have lunch and just talk about this thing? Because you seemed really, really passionate about this, and I I think that we're, um, you know, we're really disagreeing." And so we sat down. I said, "Hey," I said, "Okay." I mean, it was a good. He, he was actually a really fun guy to be around, by the way. Um, he was a guy that, um, <clears throat> this is when we lived in the Toledo, Ohio area. And so if you ever watched MASH, remember Klinger was from Toledo, and he'd talk about the, the Toledo Mud Hens. That really is a, a uh, minor league baseball team. And he knew everything about all the players in the Mud Hens. I mean, he would be the guy you'd want to go to the game with because he could, I mean, he just knew all this stuff. So we sat down to, to eat, and we were having a pleasant exchange. I said, listen, Don, um, we, we really need to talk about this thing. And this thing that we talked about was this. He said, I said, it, it sounds to me, he was, he was a musician, and he had the perspective that in order to worship God, we needed to train everyone how to sight sing. That means read the musical notes and sing by the written notes that that was a vital part to worshiping God. And he thought that we should take a Sunday school hour and teach people how to sight sing. I hear some giggles. I said, okay, Don, listen, I I know that you like, you know, being a musician, and I know that this is an important thing to you. I said, but it sounds to me like what you're saying is that worshiping God requires the gospel plus being able to sight sing music. Is that what you're saying? Well, don't you think that God's given us modern advancements and that we should be able, we should just educate ourselves on the things that we know how to do now in order to really worship God? I said, hold on. You're saying that it's the gospel plus being able to sight, read, and sing music that enables someone to worship God? Is that what you're saying? Well, don't you think that should be? I said a third time. I asked the third time. And he was adamant, yes. And I just said, listen, if you find a biblical principle to shape this view, if if that's what you found in the scriptures, please show that to me and I'm going to change my view. But I would encourage you to dig deeply. What is it that allows us to worship God? We can hear that example and we might laugh, we might giggle. But every single one of us does similar things. 
when I was growing up, you better not wear blue jeans to church. And remember when Don Johnson, Miami Vice was on, and he would wear those boat shoes with no socks? You better wear your socks. We can merge the gospel with our particular political perspectives as if they go together exactly. This is an election year. You will not hear me preach politics from the pulpit. It can be the gospel plus certain styles of music that's appropriate or inappropriate in church. It can be the gospel plus having a steeple and keeping things the way they should be. And don't you know this is the way they should be? It can be the gospel plus so many other things. We can take good things and make them ultimate things. It can be anything at all. But when those things get merged with the gospel, it actually doesn't add to the gospel. It strips the gospel of its meaning. Because we're saying it's the blood of Jesus Christ covering our sin, taking the full condemnation for us, extinguishing God's wrath so that we can be adopted as sons and daughters, plus that music style, plus sight singing, plus whatever party or political thing you want to try to merge with the gospel. Do you see it detracts? This is how we set our minds on the flesh because those other things would lead to death because it's saying Jesus isn't sufficient. And so we can easily set our minds on the things of death with our which are fleshly things because we're detracting and distracting from the gospel. Do you believe that support of a particular view or political view or candidate or party trumps the gospel? Do you believe that worshiping with different types of music than what you like condemns someone to hell? I know this, this is a strong question. No, of course. Of course we don't think that. But when we merge anything with the gospel, that is functionally and practically exactly what we mean. We get in the way of the gospel in the day to day. So where's the hope? Brings us to our third point. Why we can have confidence in the gospel, even when we get in the way. Because verse 10 tells us, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. What is Paul saying? He's been saying it in chapter 7, and now in chapter 8, every believer struggles, and every believer has the confident assurance as they struggle that Christ is in you. <laughs> We feel like a two-headed monster. We feel like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. But if Christ is in you, believer, you no longer stand condemned. That's an exclamation point. That's not an if statement. This is why we have confident assurance that even though our body struggles with the flesh and the things that lead to death, even though we struggle with sin, we do the things we don't want to do, and the things we don't want to do is what, I, is what we do. The Spirit gives us life. Even though those things are the things of death, the Spirit continues to give us life because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that was given to you. You are righteous before God now. F.F. Bruce in his little commentary on Romans says, there is no reason for those in Christ Jesus to go on doing penal servitude 
as though they've never been pardoned, never been released from the prison house of sin, penal servitude, penalty, prison, imprisonment. He says, there's no reason for us to like think that we have this, um, this prison house of sin that we live in. We live in freedom now. We've, there's no condemnation. Yes, we need to confess our sin and run back to Jesus and renounce it and repent. Yes, but we confess our sin with confident assurance, knowing that Jesus has taken the penalty for our sin. There's no condemnation for us. We have been freed. The Spirit gives us life because of what Jesus has done for us. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Look at verse 11. Every struggling believer has the resurrection power of God within them. You think that your life is a mess? Guess what? You're right. When you're struggling with sin, you know, you may not be able to verbalize it, but there's something inside you that knows that you're kind of dabbling with the things of death, the things of the devil, the things that you don't want to deal with or that you, you, you don't like that you're dealing with. You know that you need something outside of yourself to bring you to life. Even as a believer, there are those moments where you know you need something and you have it. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The same spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in believers. Why? <laughs> because we need his continual work. As we strive to crucify the flesh with its desires, we can only do that by his power. We can only obey God because the spirit is in us, giving life to us, bringing us from dead things to life. It's by the Spirit that we can take every thought captive and submit it to the Lordship of Christ, even when we want to blast somebody else verbally. We can ask the Spirit to give us the courage to walk away and pray through a situation and then to re-engage in a way that honors Christ by His power. When we want to pass judgment on someone, when we only know a little bit about their situation, we can pray and ask the Spirit to give us what we need to show that person the love of Jesus. When we want to bypass involving ourselves in a situation because it just seems too messy, the Spirit is within us and we can ask Him to give us what we need to be salt and light and be agents of His peace, His mercy, His grace, and His love. Did you know that, uh, if, well, you probably do know, if you've ever spoken to a recovering addict, and that's, a lot of, that's how they want to refer to themselves, because they want to keep the thing that they have run towards for their lives always there so that they don't go back. And what they're going to tell you is this. They can't make this journey to sobriety on their own. It takes an overwhelming amount of support. And so do we. We need an overwhelming amount of support. As we are weaning ourselves off of the fix of deadly things. And living the life that the Spirit is giving us. You know, it's interesting. Um, I read this this week. I didn't realize this happened. But did you know what happens in the brain as addicts become sober? That within a few weeks, a few months, within a year or so, they start to think differently. Their mindset is different. Their minds are different. Their brains are different. What a picture of how God works in us. God has declared that we are now no longer condemned. What Jesus has done for those who trust in him can never be taken away. It's not a mere pronouncement. It is his declaration. 
And what's more, as we continue in reading in Romans 8, we find that the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit whose resurrection power is within us, is the one who enables us to cry, Abba, Father. Because of the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we can set our minds on the things of the Spirit because He is at work within us now. He is who we need now. We need the gospel now. Father, thank you for the grace you've given us through Jesus. Holy Spirit, we praise you for the work you do in us. Shaping us to become more like Jesus and reminding us of the gospel. That because of his work, there is no condemnation for those who are in him. He has freed us from the curse of the law. He has freed us to be able to live and worship in the ways that we were designed to live and worship. Father, we pray that as you continue your work in us through the work of the Spirit, that you would open our eyes to those areas that that we are running to to add to the gospel, those things that are actually things that in the end will bring death, even the good things and that we would cling solely and exclusively to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In his name we pray.
Lord's benediction, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in his peace.